uh, we're excited today to have uh, Chang Wu from Berkeley to come give a talk for us about the Anarchy Value Store that, that they've been building at Berkeley as part of the Rise Lab. Uh, Chang is a fifth year. Uh, this, this is finishing your fifth year, correct? Yeah, yeah. He's finishing his fifth year as a PhD student at Berkeley uh, with advisor Joe Hellerstein. Um, and prior to that, he did his undergrad undergrad at Brown University. I don't think you and I overlapped, did we? No, unfortunately. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so I, with that, with that do, and so the way we'll, uh, the way we'll organize this is, uh, if you have questions, just don't raise your hand, just, you know, unmute yourself and, and shout out and you know, interrupt him as he, as he goes along. This is not, this is supposed to be interactive. So go, go for it, man. Okay, cool. Um, so, hello, uh, I'm Chang Gang. I'm a final year PhD student from Rice Lab UC Berkeley with Joe Hellerstein. I'm very excited to be here remotely, and thanks, Andy, for inviting me. And also thanks, uh, I think, if I yes. pronounced correctly, for arranging this all kinds of stuff. So I'm going to uh, talk about, uh, you know, the Anarchy Valley store. I, I tagged V0 on the slide because you know, there's actually a series of work that we've done with Anna, and today, I should be focusing on the initial piece of work, which you know put more emphasis on the theoretical side and some design principles. So hopefully, it will be more interesting than the uh, some of the following papers, which focus more on the auto scaling engineering part of this stuff. So let's get started. Um, so conventional wisdom, right, or at least you know what Jeff Dean said in his talk about the challenges in building large scale systems, says that you know whenever you want to scale your system by an order of magnitude you will have to sort of redesign the entire system and come up with new architectures and execution models. But, you know, as researchers, we want to ask so the following countercultural question. So can we build a system that achieves very good performance at any scale? So in this project, we're going to explore the answer in the context of the Anarchy Value Store. So Anna is a uh, distributed in-memory key value store. And, uh, sorry, are you guys? Slide advancing. I'm not seeing. I, I see. I see a research question. Can we build a system that delivers? Yeah. So it's weird because I'm advancing on my side, but not seeing yours advancing. Oh, there it As, goes. Or, yeah. There's some lag sometimes. Yeah. So Anna is a distributed in-memory key value store. So the name actually refers to a uh, California native you know, hummingbird, which is the fastest animal relative to its size. And indeed, you know, our key value store, at least you know, the initial version of it, is pretty lightweight with only a few thousand lines of C++. And you know, despite the size of the code base, right, Anna delivers very high performance across any scale from a single multi-core machine to new architecture to a geo-distributed deployment. Anna can outperform many state-of-the-art key value stores by over an order of magnitude. And in addition, Anna supports a wide spectrum of consistency guarantees, which includes things like last rider win, some basic consistency, and as well as causal consistency, and also some transactional isolation levels, such as read committed. So let's just talk about you know, why the two aspects that I focus on, namely you know, any scale high performance and flexibility in consistency are important. So in terms of scalability, right, in a distributed setting, it's already very well understood that we want our system's performance to grow as we add in more and more machines, right? But scalability is actually also crucial even within the single node. So modern cloud providers like AWS right now offers multi-core beefy servers with very high computing capabilities. Like they now offer machines with 64 CPU cores or more. Right? So if we're going to use these beefy servers for our application, it's very important to you know, be able to efficiently utilize those computing resources as much as possible. So there are systems like Redis cluster that can exploit multi-core power zone. And you know, things like Cassandra can have good scalability in a distributed setting. But at least you know, two, three years ago, there was no key value store that excels at all scales with a unified architecture. And also in terms of consistency, right? So high performance key value store should ideally be able to benefit a wide range of applications. So these applications, the problem is may vary in their consistency demand, right? So for example, if we use the key value store as a caching service, we may you know, want to tolerate a certain degrees of staleness, but at least you know, we would like eventual consistency where the replica eventually converts to the same state. And sometimes we need stronger guarantees. For example, in an online shopping cart, 
we may want you know, to track the causal dependencies between updates from different users that may share a same shopping cart account, in which, we may, in which case we may need a stronger guarantees like causal consistency. And finally, for large scale index, in indexing, we may want you know, the update to our index and the data to appear atomically as a unit. Right? So we need some form of transactional isolation in these cases. So basically, that's why you know, any scale high performance and flexibility and consistency are important for key value store. So do you, you listed yeah. that you guys support item cut. Do you actually have an application that wants item cut? For item cut, item potent cut, we actually didn't find a uh, application that really can take advantage of that specific consistency level. It's been listed in Bayless's, you know, highly available transactions work, but I, I think for that specific level, it remains pretty theoretical in the literature. That, that's why I asked. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's focus on the scalability side first. So I'm gonna first discuss, you know, the fundamental limitation of the state-of-the-art shared memory model within a single machine, and then present, you know, how Anna sort of addresses this limitation with its coordination-free actor model. I'll then talk about, you know, how to extend Anna's execution model from a single node to a distributed set. So the shared memory model is you know, actually very widely used within a single multi-core machine. So basically, we spin up one thread per each CPU core, and these thread can reason writes to the shared memory space. And popular in memory storage systems like Memcached, Mastery, and Hackathon CPW tree uses this model. So the problem you know, is that whenever write operations are involved, updates operations are involved, right? we need to apply some form of thread synchronization to prevent memory corruption. And synchronization usually takes place as a form of locking, like mutexes and spin locks. But recently, you know, lock-free data structures such as Intel's Threat Building Block (TBB) have also been introduced, which uses this single instruction atomic uh, compare swap to serialize conflicting operations. And there are some studies that shows, you know, synchronization using lock-free approach can be cheaper than locking. But the question is, you know, is lock-free really good enough? So here we show that even the state-of-the-art lock-free synchronization can have pretty poor scalability in a multi-core machine. So basically what we did is a micro-benchmark that used the TDB hash map to build a very simple in-memory key value store and just benchmark its performance against a single-threaded baseline with write-heavy workload. So under high contention, right, where only a small subset of keys are being accessed, the aggregated throughput of TV hash map actually decreases pretty significantly as we increase the thread count. And this is you know, pretty obviously because in shared memory model, you know, concurrent updates to the same data have to be serialized. And in addition to that, the majority of CPU time is actually devoted to retry when the atomic instruction fails. So as a result, not surprisingly, the throughput is even a lot lower than using a single thread. So this observation also agrees with some recent study on lock-free synchronization by uh, Falero and Abadi. So the way Anna sort of addresses this limitation is via its what we call coordination-free actor model. So in, in this model, instead of just using a shared memory model, each thread only has access to its private memory view. Because of this, there is you know, very straightforward, there's no need for locks or lock-free uh, synchronization at all because you know, every thread just access its own thing. And in case you know, thread performs updates to replicas of the same data, Anna just let them propagate these updates asynchronously in the background via explicit message passing. And because gossip you know, only happens periodically in the background, the overhead doesn't occur on the execution's critical path. So you know, in this model, there's no overhead due to waiting whatsoever, which is one of the key design insights that makes the system perform fast. Now, by employing this weight-free execution model, right, Anna is able to achieve good scalability within a single machine. But the next question is, we want to go distributed, right? So what changes do we have to make to extend this model into a distributed setting? So the answer is actually there's no change required at all, because since we're using async message passing instead of shared memory, right, we've essentially just built a small distributed system within a single machine. And you know, extending this model to a real distributed setting requires no work because we can just simply adding more and more machines without making any change to our execution model, and the system just scales very naturally. So, hi, the, yeah. can, can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, this is Ling. Uh, I think we chatted okay. over last year, Sigma. Last yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice, nice, nice to talk to you. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I have a question: Is that when you say um, 
Hana is using this um, um, uh, propagation of the gossips, right, to mm -hmm. apply the changes. So I, I, was, I was thinking you, you eventually need to apply the rights at some point anyway, right? Yes. But so, so when, when you eventually apply the rights, even though it's, it's asynchronous, but you still don't need any log, any protection? Uh, so, so whenever we use protection, we're, we're talking about the model where, you know, there are multiple threads concurrently updating the shared memory region, single region. Right? Mm -hmm. So in this mm -hmm. model, when they exchange messages, um, mm -hmm. what would happen is that one thread will send a message through, you know, you know either a TCP channel or IPC channel to another thread. Right. So in that sense, we don't need to apply anything like locking and atomic instructions. So another, another uh, subtle point, but important point, is that this gossiping is done periodically, so every 10 seconds or 100 seconds. So imagine you have a workload that's you know, really write heavy. Right? So during this 10 second gossip, the same data may get updated you know, 100 or 1,000 times. But mm -hmm. at the end of the 10 second, right, this thread only gossip the end state of the object. To other oh, right, right. I see. I see. Right. I see. So in that sense, yeah, 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 exactly. I see. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, I have a, I have yeah, a follow-on question to that. Okay, so you can imagine you're in a bank, and there's a bunch of bank tellers, and you're giving very good service to that first row of bank tellers. Right. When there's the the issue is is behind the scenes at that second level, and uh, and and database this this creates a situation like rights queue, mm -hmm. right where where two people read something and then write, and then that write is a problem. So uh, when you push that thing off, uh, there has to be some kind of a resolution, which uh, in Jim Gray's book, he talked about this as uh, writing wormholes to the log. In other words, uh, that initial, the solution to it requires time travel. So the mm -hmm. question is, how do you deal with that I guess you're going to talk about this. Yeah. So if we're going to talk, uh, so basically the straight up answer is that you know Anna only support a limited type of coordination free consistency model. So the, the phenomenon you talked about, like right skew, that you know definitely important for use cases like bank applications and stuff, typically requires stronger consistency guarantees, like you know, either serializability or stronger version of a snapshot isolation which is actually beyond the scope of consistencies that Anna can support. So, so, so you, you have yeah. no ACID uh, characteristics at all? Right, no, no, no ACID transactions, definitely, no, no ACID transactions. So basically the, the, the design principle that in, in, in our mind is that, you know, ACID transactions, those consistency that require strict coordinations is at odd with, uh, you know, auto scaling, super high performance sec, uh, scaling key value store, yes. So there's a hard trade-off between these two. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you keep track? I mean, I, I don't know if you're going to talk about the talk about the gossip protocol, but this so new. This sounds like new DB. Would they keep track of like where data, like the home node or, or thread of data, and they know who who needs to be told? Hey, here's an update. Are you maintaining any of that, or is it just like propagate whatever? Yeah so, for, for, yeah, so for now, um, so first of all, Anna does multi-master replication, which means, you know, if the data is replicated three way, those three replica can all accept updates and they gossip to each other. And for now, we're not super, uh, you know, optimized for or, you know, paying special attention to how efficient this gossip process is. So ideally, you know, you can imagine if we have, you know, 10-way replica, then it would be nice to apply some form of tree-based you know, gossip. And you know, there are even other optimizations you can do to selectively replicate you know, keys that are more important and vary the gossip period for, uh, per key. But for now, we're, we're not optimized for that. But that's definitely a certain pattern that we're observing that could be very useful in a lot of applications. Yeah. Okay. Does your, just what another what a to, quick, to, quick, quick to follow to, to, to Charles. Charles. <laughs> So just for everyone, when you, when you ask a question, just say who you are and wh where you're coming from. Okay, I'm, my name's Charlie Johnson. I used to work at Tandem and then uh, HP Labs and now at oh. Nutanix. Awesome. And, cool. and uh, so uh, when you're gossiping, uh, do you at all talk about these kinds of conflicts so that these might raise, be raised in some level with some kind of resolution later? Yeah, yeah, that's the second part of uh, the we'll talk. Then. Okay, Definitely. all right, all right. Yes, yes. Cool. Any other questions?
no. All right, let's go ahead. Yeah, so that's basically the slide. <laughs> so, but you know, this execution model obviously, you know, introduces a new challenge because we propagate those updates asynchronously. Right? So the same set of updates may arrive at each thread in different order. For example, here we have, let's say, a value replicated across three threads. And at the beginning, you know, thread T1 may write value A and T2 writes B and T3 writes C, respectively, to the replica. And later on, you know, T1 may receive the gossip from other two threads in order A, C, and B, right? T2 in order B, A, and C, and T3 in order C, B, and A. So if we are naively just let the gossip overwrite all existing values, then obviously the states across replica will diverge, which is bad. So basically, I want to shift the discussion from scalability part to consistency and talk about sort of how Anna uses lattices to achieve replica conversions and implement you know, a wide spectrum of coordination-free models. So Anna addresses the consistency issue by sort of encapsulating the replicated data into a lattice. So we can think of lattice as you know, just a very simple data structure, which contains an element of some data type and has a merge function that updates is element in a way that is associative, commutative, and idempotent. We call them ACI properties. So in the database community, right, the idea of leveraging ACI for conflict resolution actually has a long history. And the concept of lattice is also the basis of the CRDTs introduced by uh, Mark Shapori et al. So for example, here we have a set lattice, right? So whose element is just a set, and the merge function is a very simple set union whose ACI property can be very easily verified. And Lattice's ACI property can, well, what it can achieve for us is that it shields application from anomaly due to message reordering and duplication, you know, both of which happen very frequently in the distributed setting. So yeah, we use that Lattice to represent this monotonic growing timestamp and how the merge logic works is that, you know, um, you know given an input, right, if we first compare the two integers, right, if the inputs max Lattice dominates, then we basically overwrite the value, and otherwise we will keep the current value. Right? And definitely is easily verifiable that this satisfies the ACI property. And for the same set of updates, right, regardless of their ordering, the updates with the largest timestamp will always overwrite the others. So the figure on the right basically shows how we compose lattices to implement last writer win. The key value store itself is implemented as a lattice value map lattice whose element you know, is an unordered hash map, and the keys could be you know, any type, but the value is the last writer win lattice that I just discussed, with the max lattice being a representing the timestamp. So when the input key doesn't exist in the map lattice, we'll just simply update the map with the input key value pair, and otherwise we invoke the merge function of last writer win lattice to resolve the conflict to achieve replica convergence. I think Tianyu has a question. Uh, yeah, sorry, a quick question. So uh, I'm Tianyu. Currently at MIT, I think we met at Berkeley last year. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, the, I guess one, one question here is that you, you seem to rely on some sort of timestamp to resolve right conflicts here, but doesn't that sort of require coordination outside of your normal gossiping just to get Yeah, that, so the timestamp, right? so the current implementation of timestamp is uh, generated by, uh, from the client side using you know, the wall clock time. So uh, in that sense, it doesn't require strict coordination, but you know, that at the same time means the timestamp may not you know, truly respect the, the real order that the event happened because you know, different clients, their, their clock may be slightly skewed. So you know, the only thing that you know, the last order win achieves, accomplished, is to guarantee eventual replica convergence without coordination, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee you know, that the last value you've seen happens Really, you know, it's the latest up, update that happens in terms of the wall clock time. That's the trade-off. Okay, cool. Yeah, Isn't that open, opening you up to like, um, like someone fucking around with like, like a, a malicious client giving you funky timestamps? Oh, so, so the, <laughs> yeah, so, so by client, I mean the, the, the Anna client that we embed in the user applications. But, you know, if they hack the Anna client, yeah, currently that can happen. <laughs> okay. But I feel like that if you if you're geo distributed though, doesn't that give you some all kinds of fairness problem across replicas? So like like unless the data center coordinate their the clock drift or something. So I, yeah, fairness in what sense are you thinking about the? It's like basically if you have a data center that whose clock runs faster, they basically always win out, right? Uh, 
Yeah, that could be. So if a, if a certain region of the client, you know, their um, somehow their their timestamp being generated is always ahead of the rest of them, that could be an issue. And you're you're right that we definitely if if that kind of issue arises, we, we definitely need to look into that. So somehow come up with some solution to sort of uh, periodically sync, you know, those client side clocks and stuff like that. So, okay, but basically what you're saying is if you if you just happen to have true time, this is not a problem. If you happen to have true time, yeah, this is not a problem. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. True time is, is requires coordination to, you know, in reality. Which, yes. So um, let's go through, you know, just the same example because the previous one is a little bit abstract. So let's just go through the same example and see, you know, how last regular win resolves the conflict among replicas. Right? So the thread still receives update in different order. Right? So T1 in order ACB and T2 in order, you know, BAC and T3 in order CB and A. So, but these times, these updates are timestamped, right? So A with 101, B with 142, and C with 123. So although T2, T2 right, receives C in the end, and T3 receives A in the end, the value that's corresponding to the largest timestamp, which is you know, B with 142, will always dominate. So you know, the use of lattice in this case guarantees eventual replica convergence. And note that you know, last writer win is actually the simplest and weakest uh, consistency model supported by Anna because as uh, we discussed before, it only guarantees convergence. It doesn't, doesn't guarantee any form of you know, uh, time and true time and stuff. But you know, there are definitely stronger alternatives that we support. So recently, not recently, 2013, you know, Bayless summarizes a, a wide spectrum of coordination-free models. And you know, we found that by carefully composing these different lattices together, Anna is able to you know, implement pretty much all of them with very little code change uh, as shown in this figure. But due to time constraint, I'm not going to go through uh, the detailed definition of all of these other kind of alternatives for now. But instead, I'm going to talk about some evaluation results. So first present the performance of uh, Anna's coordination-free execution model. And then I'm going to show how Anna smoothly scales from a single deployment to a distributed setting. And we also benchmark against you know, other state-of-the-art key value stores in the macro level. But due to cut time constraint, I'm probably going to skip that part. So the first, first experiment, we want to answer the question of, you know, can Anna's coordination-free execution model achieve high scalability in a multi-core machine? So as discussed before, Anna replicates keys for performance. And in this work, we use a, a single replication factor for all keys. I'll return to that for the end of the talk. But to benchmark the key value store's full capacity, for now, requests are pre-generated on the server side. So we compare the performance with other single node systems, including the TV hash map and mastery, which is another in-memory key value store that's pretty popular. As a performance baseline, we also implemented a shared memory key value store that doesn't really use any threat synchronization whatsoever. And because of that, right, this key value store is not even correct. And memory corruption can even happen. But you know, nevertheless, it represents the fastest performance one can get with a shared memory model. And we denote this key value store as ideal on the figure. So with high contention, right, for Anna, we see the performance scales nicely up to its replication factor. And this is because you know, different threads are able to process updates to the same data concurrently on different replicas. And all shared memory key value store don't scale at all just you know, due, due to serialization overhead. And as I mentioned before, the atomic instruction overhead. And interestingly, you know, although the ideal shared memory key value store performed better than TDB and masteries and stuff, it still failed to scale because of the significant cache invalidation overhead. So at thread count 32, Anna can outperform mastery and TDB by up to several hundred times. And uh, sorry, quick question on your yeah, previous please. graph. Uh, what uh, what uh, coordination-free consistency model are you using for this experiment? Because it sounds so to me like the other ones will have different consistency models, right? Yeah, right. All of them is for Anna the configuration is last rate of win, and for all the other shared memory key value stores. So I mentioned for the ideal one is no synchronization, so no consistency, not even correct. Okay. For mastery and TBB, they're using shared memory model, and shared memory model gives you linearizability for free. So in that sense, definitely they're achieving stronger, you know, coordination full consistency levels. Yes. Okay. So we, you can think of it as. Um, you know, although Anna achieves super high performance, but it's definitely relaxing the consistency model it's trying to achieve. Okay, cool, thanks. And why the performance of ideal is not ideal? 
Yeah, so yeah, so uh, the the term ideal is a little bit misleading in the sense that it's ideal only in the shared. So if we keep the the regime to be within shared memory model, it's ideal in that sense. Yeah. So it basically is the fastest thing you can achieve if you let different threads just simultaneously update thing in a shared memory region without any protection. So it's ideal because it's better than TDB and mastery and represent the highest performance you can get in that regime. But still, you know, uh, you're bottlenecked by the caching validation. So that's the point. It's not like true speed of light thing. I see. So it's basically bottlenecked by, it's, 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 by a, it's almost worse than ANAP just because of the caching validation. Just because of caching validation. You're it's, exactly it's, right. It's, it's, a, it's because of the caching validation among different NUMA regions or even in the same NUMA region. It's just... So based on our observation, definitely there are both factors mostly present, but even in the same NUMA region, there's definitely caching validation costs that are exact, uh, exacerbated. Okay, okay, sure, thanks. Uh, sorry, sorry to sort of keep you on this slide, but is there, uh, do you observe any sort of difference depending on what your, you configure the gossip period to be? Um, yeah, sure. So basically for here, I believe the gossip period is like uh, once per every 10 to 100 millisecond. But you can imagine, you know, under high contention workload, if you know, on one extreme, if you keep the gossip period to be really, really short, like one microsecond or something, you know, that's no different from full, full replication because you're, you're essentially like you know, gossiping every update to, to, to right. So on the other extreme, if it's very, very high period, like gossip every one minute, then you'll see a perfectly linear scaling because the gossip overhead is just unnoticeable. Okay. So in the real application, it really depends on how stale your application can, uh, how, how tolerant you know, your application can be to staleness. And you, can, you should be able to tune your gossip period accordingly. But right. this yeah, is nice. just benchmarking, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, just, just, yes. A, a, just another point on this. Sure. Go gossiping, in other words, the more you do of it, uh, the more you're going to be sharing memory because every cache invalidation is a memory write, right? On an Intel mm -hmm. box. Right. So, so if you're, if you're doing high contention, then you're going to be that, that whole thing is going to come down. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what we call a compressed, uh, on sender trick where we, it's, it's in, in some other sense, it's taking advantage of lattices of subjectivity in a sense that if you, you know, uh, it, it, say your application tolerates certain degrees of stillness, say 10 milliseconds, right? It sort of relates to the question that I answered back by 10 minutes ago that during that, you know, 10 millisecond, you can pack up writes locally and only cost up the end state to reduce the amount of, you know, uh, contention that you incur. No, this, this isn't a, an advertisement for Gen Z, but if, if you had multiple nodes and you were sharing memory across Gen Z, of course, because it's, there's no coherency, your your cache invalidations would just affect your local node, and so uh, you might actually still get this scale. Since you're not coordinating anyway, in other words, no asset. Okay, so uh, so you remind me the the Gen G stuff that uh, I'm not super familiar with it. Uh, yeah, so that's that's an HP Labs thing. Sorry. Okay. Okay. So yeah, maybe we can talk. A bit more about offline, but uh, and not super <laughs> familiar with all the details and stuff. Yeah, yeah. cool. Uh, okay, so low contention. Right? So low contention, all key value stores scales linearly, which is good. But you know, Anna with replication factor one can still significantly outperform all the alternatives. And the reason you know is that even without contention, the overhead due to atomic instruction is just much higher than regular instruction. And this overhead occurs importantly on the critical path of every reason rise to share memory. And interestingly, we see that, you know, once we start to increase Anna's replication factor, its performance start to go down and down. This is because, you know, within a gossip period, low contention, the number of distinct keys being updated will grow significantly, which in turn increases the gossip overhead. So that teaches us a lesson that, you know, a key hotness can be, can have a very big impact on performance. And probably, you know, having a single replication factor across all keys is not a good idea, which I'll come back to towards the end. So then we answer the question, you know, can Anna's execution model provide sort of smooth scaling across different scales? So here, the first, you know, 32 threads are on a single machine shown in blue, and the 33rd through 64 threads are on the second machine shown in yellow, and threads from 65 onwards are on the third machine shown in green. 
So we do observe a small performance degradation between the 32nd and 33rd thread because you know there's a place. This is a place where we start to introduce distributed gossiping overhead. But you know, in general, the performance scales linearly, and so Anna's execution model does let the performance scale smoothly from a single node to a distributed setting. So basically, just two high-level takeaways, right? So shared memory model introduces high contention overhead. So let's use Threadful Core plus private memory access to eliminate synchronization. And the second point is that by using lattices, it provides a neat way to achieve replica convergence and you know, lattice composition by carefully composing these different lattice pieces together allows Zana to support a wide spectrum of consistency models. And of course, you know, the third bullet point that I didn't put in is that we are uh, sort of achieving all of these performance gains and consistency gain by sacrificing you know, coordination full consistency levels, so what we call strong consistencies, like serializable ability, linearizability, and snapshot isolation. Those consistencies are not supported by Anna. Um, uh, so before so, I go uh, to next, uh, any questions at this point? Yes. Yeah, sorry, uh, just curious. So did you uh, have any numbers to measure sort of the, the difference between really uh, within a single node, the, the overhead of gossiping and over-distributed gossiping. So for example, if you have 32 core on a single machine versus if you have 32 servers each with one core, like, can you, can, can you quantify that performance difference? Yeah, so we, we didn't put that figure on the paper, but we definitely measured them because uh, implementation-wise, when we're gossiping within node, uh, so implementation-wise, we're using ZeroMQs, uh, either TCP um, message passing or in, uh, inter-process message passing. And within each node, we use the uh, improc message passing mechanism. And underneath, it's just you know, putting and getting to a shared queue, I guess. And across node, we're using TCP transport. So definitely, there is a significant amount of difference in terms of the gossip overhead. But what happened exactly during the macro benchmark is that because we noticed that the performance is actually bottlenecked by the network side, so the difference between internal gossip versus intranode gossip is actually not as pronounced as in our micro benchmark. So that's our observation. OK, cool. Thanks. Cool. Any, any other questions before I move on to what happened next? <laughs> just just maybe, maybe a suggestion that if, if you did this with the RDMA uh, uh, thing that uh, allows you to do memory to memory transfers by MMAP, mm -hmm. Uh, that can operate at full memory speed across yeah, the yeah, network. This definitely. would be an interesting experiment. Exactly, exactly. So I think in th in theoretically and both, and I'm very curious to do the experiment. It will definitely boost the, uh, the, the transfer efficiency a lot. I guess. Yeah. So did you guys, when you first does, sort of start out, started the project, did you, did you know at the beginning that you were going to go with an actor model, or is that something you sort of organically discovered as, as, you know, over time? Yeah, I mean, at the beginning, I, I don't think I even knew that this actor model thing, and the, 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 the sort of beginning of this project is that we noticed, so because we started with, you know, what everybody else did, the shared memory model, right? We just started with that, and as we benchmark with varying workloads, with varying contention levels and concurrent threads and stuff, I just noticed that, that um, the TV stuff just fails to scale. <laughs> so how to solve that, right? So that, that's sort of, you know, what motivated that work. And, you know, the simplest thing is you don't coordinate. So if you don't coordinate, you go fast, but then how do you deal with consistency? And that, uh, you know, introduced lattice and stuff. So that's how everything pans out, I guess. Did, uh, did you, is there a framework you're using for your actor model implementation, or did you roll your own? Um, actually, for the initial Anna, we wrote everything our own. We didn't use any, like, existing actor libraries and stuff. Okay. We, we implemented our own lattice composition libraries and stuff, which is sort of open source. So. Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, I guess related question, when you use zero MQ as sort of your messaging framework, right? So are you differentiating between local and remote messages at all? Or are you just going to pay the same serialization overhead for both of them? Uh, so implementation wise, when you're gossiping in, yeah, so, so actually it's, we are differentiating it in terms of when, when we're gossiping uh, within each node, we just uh, make a, a path, we're just passing the pointer around. Uh, okay. And whereas, you know, in, internal node communication, we're actually serializing, deserializing, and sending messages and stuff. So yes, we're, we are differentiated. All right, cool. Cool. 
so basically, I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know what happened next because this this first Anna version is actually like we started 2017, 2018 ish. So 2019. So what we did is that so one of the key limitations that I mentioned before is that it's Anna is very sensitive to this replication factor thing and workload skew, right? So you know when the when the contention is high, you want to aggressively replicate your data to spread the load. But you know when the contention is low, ideally you actually want to minimize your your replication factor to sort of reduce the cost of overhead. But the problem is like you don't know your workload ahead of time. Right? So it would be very nice if you know Anna can just dynamically adjust each key's replication factor based on the workload skew. And you know, higher level picture, you know, 2018 to 2019 is where you know the concept of serverless become more and more popular, right? So you know, going even even deeper and higher, it would be nice if you know the developers won't have to worry about you know how many nodes to deploy and what's the optimal configuration of replication factors and stuff. And they instead should just specify you know high level goals like latency, SLO, and cost budget. And ideally, the system should be able to tune dynamically based on this budget to achieve the optimality. Okay? So the second push for Anna, Anna V1 is to make it towards a serverless key value store where it can dynamically adjust its deployment based on the workload skew and achieve the high level goals specified by the end user. So that's what happened in 2019. And, and then going to 2020, right? So now, right? so basically, you know, serverless computing is just taking off more and more, and people start to, to use it more and more. And especially, I think at Berkeley, there have been tremendous amount of attention put into serverless, and we're really the strong believer that you know serverless will take off in the next you know five or ten years. Everybody will just start using serverless. Everything will become serverless. So if you look at you know what exists today, there are some AWS, there's some serverless computing platforms right, existing. Um, platforms provided by some cloud providers, AWS, Google Cloud Functions, Azure Functions, and stuff like that. They're really good at handling stateless workload in the sense that you, know, you just upload a function, it executes it for you, it returns a result without accessing any external shared mutable state. But you know, if we believe that the serverless computing is really going to take off, everybody's going to use it, then your workload is going to be inevitably consist of some access to remote shared, memory, uh, shared mutable state. So currently, how it's done is that, for example, if you use Lambda, you can do a remote call to your data that's stored in the, either in DynamoDB or S3. That kind of introduces two issues. The first one is like existing key value stores, S3 DynamoDB, doesn't have as rich consistency level as provided by Anna. And the second problem is that once you leave your function executor, once you make that remote function call, you're going to incur one extra network round trip. And especially when your data is large, that overhead can be very huge. So basically, what we want to achieve in the next project called Cloudburst is to build a serverless computing framework using Anna as a storage backplane that simultaneously achieves you know, low latency function serving and at the same time, rich level of consistency provided by Anna. And sort of the, the one sentence summary, the key insight is that we just attach a cache, uh, you know, co-located with each function executor. You know, when you cache stuff, things become faster. So that's very obvious gain, but the challenge comes, you know, wh whenever you have a cache, you always need to worry about, you know, your cache staleness and stuff and how it collaborates with Anna to provide meaningful consistency levels. So the real research challenge for the Cloudburst project is how to, you know, as I mentioned before, simultaneously achieve pretty strong consistency levels. So we actually pushed you know, Anna's consistency even further to what we call transactional causal consistency, which is the fastest, sorry, which is the strongest consistency level that you can achieve in a coordination-free setting while eliminating the network round trip as much as possible. So that's the Cloudburst project. And sort of last slide, what's happening next and now is that, you know, this is not so much of like my you know, grand vision, but it's definitely Joe's grand vision of like he wanna, he's been trying to answer the question of how do we program the cloud for the next like, you know, for the last like 20 years or so, right? So he definitely wants to build a project called like, and now the project is called Hydro that encapsulated both Cloudburst and Anna. It's supposed to be a platform for programming the cloud. Right? So basically, we've been building things from ground up. We have Anna that act as a storage and overlay network built with lattice composition, and then Cloudburst, which is a containerized you know, service computing platform with consistent hashing and fault tolerance built in. So the next step is to go from you know, further upward to take a look at the programming language side. So there's definitely a polygon of programming models available. It's becoming popular. We have things like logic programming, a la Bloom. 
know, functional reactive programming, Rx, actors, and ACA, and more recently, you know, futures and Ray. And who knows, you know, in the next five or 10 years, what's the next best programming model would be. So given all these popularities, I, we want to, you know, make a uh, cloud compiler toolkit, tentatively naming, you know, hydrolysis that takes in all of these models and emit intermediate representation in hydrologic, which is a universal disorderly algebra for cloud computing that's then can be emitted into Cloudburst runtime for efficient execution. So that's sort of, you know, our group's sort of grand vision towards what's happening next. And hopefully, like, probably I won't be, you know, in the journey of developing hydrologics and hydrolysis, but uh, hopefully the younger PhD student will take on from, from that point on. So that's pretty much all I have today. Um, happy to take questions. Awesome. Uh, so we obviously can't applaud. Uh, <laughs> you could hit the applaud button. But it's, it's, in my opinion, that's an empty gesture. Um, all right, so any questions? Uh, yeah, so I guess not necessarily related to this presentation because I just happened to read uh, Cloudburst and was it HydroCache? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paper. So when you when you say you sort of support fault tolerance, can you can you go maybe go a little bit deeper into what kind of model you have in mind? Yeah. So the the fault tolerance paper is actually not part of the HydroCache paper. It's it's called AFT, uh, called Atomic Fault Tolerance and and Serverless Computing. And in that paper, we're focusing on uh, supporting uh, what we call uh, Bayless's uh, RAMP protocol, which stands for Read Atomic Multi-Partition Transaction, which avoids both dirty read and fractured read. And we apply that, we, we basically ex extended his protocol into the serverless setting to achieve uh, exactly one's function execution. Right? And actually, worth, one, one thing worth mentioning is that that paper is not limited to Cloudburst and Anna because it's based, it's uh, built with the mindset of being a shim layer that can, uh, you know, have any kind of uh, function executors on top, be it Lambda, Google Cloud Function, or Cloudburst, and can have any storage system on, on the knees, like S3, DynamoDB, and Anna. So it's a plug and play middleware layer that can just, you know, you don't, you, hopefully, you know, you don't have to make any change in your application, you just insert our layer, and it just guarantee you, you know, richer fault tolerance guarantees. This is, this is, this is Vikram's paper on archive. Yeah, so okay. if, uh, if we, yeah, so all of the papers are on my webpage, and uh, I think it's the second or third one. It's called AFT, uh, Atomic Fault Tolerance in Service Computing. Okay, and if I remember correctly, this is just like a delta layer, basically, you put on top of any storage layer. Right, it's a shim layer that sits between the fast compute layer and uh, the storage layer. And without that shim layer, you're still basically requiring serverless functions to be idempotent because when something fails, you don't roll back any intermediate exactly. state. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the middle layer itself doesn't do rollback. So we rely on, I remember we rely on two fundamental, two, two important things. We rely on the underlying storage system to provide persistent guarantee, but persistency guarantee. And we basically keep what, uh, you know, whatever retry policy that um, you have for the upper function execution. Layer. But, if you only do retries, how do you handle sort of a, I mean, when you, when you fail in between, say, a function execution, right, that you might need to redo stuff, but you also might need to undo stuff, right? Yeah, so the, the middle layer does, uh, you know, put, uh, you know, push all the changes made within a function or a DAG atomically at the end. So there's some buffering going on that, you know, okay. uh, it's a little bit detailed limitation, but it avoids you know, uh, pushing this partial updates that are later seen as anomaly by other function executors. So it's like another cache layer essentially in front of your uh, hydro cache yeah, layer? So, so, yeah, so the middle layer, so, so, the, so the aft shim layer itself acts also as a caching and buffer layer. Okay. Cool. Any other questions? Uh, I have a, uh, uh, a point of interest perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, um, you're, you're working on Amazon AWS, right? Yeah, for now, all of our deployment is run on AWS. Yeah. Uh, having spent a, 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 an unfortunate amount of time trying to get <laughs> RDMA working on uh, AWS, it doesn't. And, and they're in plans, it won't. So <laughs> okay. the two things you want to do with RDMA is this yeah. memory to memory thing, which in the InfiniBand people flog, and also uh, remote access to EB, EBS disks. Neither one of those is in plan for the mm. foreseeable future. 
whereas on, on Azure, of course, yeah. because Azure is supporting uh, provisioning uh, SGE systems from HPE, mm. uh, you have full InfiniBand access and you will be able to run at memory speed with low latency and try it out on Azure, uh, you will actually be able to do the full RDMA thing and you'll get the full performance that they're getting oh, nice. in the high and the high performance <laughs> transaction systems, say yeah. at AIM, AIMS, uh, AIMS uh, NASA, and yeah. all these other places. So it's like, if you want to get the fastest performance, that's what you do. And you, would, you should cool. be able to do that on Azure without any trouble. Right, right, right. So having you know support for multi-cloud, GCP, Azure, and AWS, three of them, is definitely good. And it and will, a, will provide a, us more comparison point as well. Yes. And there's a, there's a, a talk that that's the slides are online yeah. uh, from HBTS Conference 2019 and by Tim Kraska of MIT. It's called okay. Fast, Fast Networks and the Next Generation of Transactional Database Systems. You might want to look at that because he shows dual XDR uh, InfiniBand performance that is just mm -hmm. faster than memory speed, which is like right, what you right, want. Right, right. Yeah, I should definitely sync up with Tim. And also, yeah, what's the name of Graston working on? I think Irfan has been working on it, but yeah. Yeah, definitely worth thinking of. Definitely. Yeah, he's at, uh, at DSAIL, the Data Systems and AI Lab. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, yeah. Tim was yeah. my uh, undergrad research <laughs> advisor. So, yeah. Ah. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, we, we, uh, we know Tim. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll leave it at that.